We got to talk about World War III and what the Secretary of State just had to say. First, let's set this up for you. People hear about World War III and they think, what's Russia and Ukraine got to do with World War III? Well, you got to look at it this way, folks. You've got two massive axes, and I hate using that as a reference, but I think it's appropriate. Consider this, you got Russia on one side, who's now since uh, the uh, Cold War, so the first time since the 1970s, started loading nuclear missiles, strategic and tactical localized nuclear missiles onto ships for the first time since the 70s. But you have the uh, alliance between uh, not just Russia uh, and Belarus, but you've also got now the strengthening alliance between Russia and Iran, which this is quite prob problematic because Iran basically supplies weapons to Houthi rebels in Yemen who like to uh, you know, strategically attack uh, countries in the region, uh, including the United Arab Emirates. And this is not great. You have a lot of regional tension here, and Iran is basically feeding this while at the same time the United States takes over fishing vessels and sometimes captures thousands of uh, uh, rifles like AK-47s or hundreds of thousands of bullets, ammunition, 5.56, five, you name it. Uh, and, and, and the United States Navy is, is taking these weapons and bullets. And usually what the United States does is they take these weapons and they destroy them. But now they're actually thinking about taking these weapons and potentially, and this is against the United Nations conventions on this, potentially sending them to Ukraine. So in other words, you're literally, uh, dare I say, Stealing might not be the right word, but essentially taking from Iran weapons that are manufactured by Iran and then you're giving them to Ukraine, potentially. Now, that's pretty wild. Now, remember, uh, Iran backs the Houthis who create a lot of problematic issues in the region of the Middle East, but now potentially taking thousands of assault rifles and ammunition, seizing those and transferring them to Ukraine would be against UN, the UN arms embargo. Here's actually a Wall Street Journal ar uh, article talking about exactly that. It actually says here, the US has provided Ukraine with more than 100 million rounds of small arms ammunition as of this week, 13,000 grenade launchers, guns, and rifles, according to the Pentagon. And at the rate at which Ukraine is expending ammunition, which is substantially greater than the current rate of production, there are calls on ending the United Nations arms embargo requiring the US and the allies and its allies to destroy, store, or rid seized weapons. But now you've got the United States seizing weapons from Iran, either being transported from Iran to Houthis or directly from Houthis, and potentially thinking about sending them to Ukraine. So think about how, how you're setting up for this sort of world war, where on one side you have Russia with its now loaded up strategic tactical nuclear missiles in combination with Belarus or supported by Belarus, which is important because that's where the Minsk 1 and 2 peace accords were signed, which are essentially torn up now. So again, on one side, you've got Russia, Belarus, Iran, who, by the way, Iran is now considering building a drone factory 600 miles east of Moscow so they can make somewhere around 6,000 kamikaze drones with stronger engines to travel further and faster to dodge uh, Ukrainian anti-suicide drone defenses. And you have this combination solidifying, again with these factories now being placed potentially within Russia itself, so Iran can profit off the war, but not have the risk of having to transport those weapons from Iran to Russia, where they could get captured by the United States and then actually be given to the uh, to Ukraine. Instead, Iran's like, we'll just build a factory inside Russia. So you can move the product directly from within Russia to the front lines. Anyway, so on one side, you've got Russia, Belarus, and Iran. On the other side, you've got obviously the United States, Germany, the United Kingdom, uh, Spain, Portugal, Canada, France. But listen to this, the United Kingdom is doubling down on their aggressive posture. Rishi uh, Sunak, who took over from Liz Truss's uh, very brief stint as uh, prime minister, who uh, didn't outlast a head of lettuce. Anyway, Mr. Sunak is now urging a double down in supporting Ukraine 
but is also pledging that Ukraine should indeed become a member of NATO, North Atlantic a, a Treaty Organization. This, this would be problematic. In fact, many say it's the entire reason Russia invaded Ukraine in the first place is because NATO keeps expanding uh, towards Russia and Russia wants a buffer between itself and NATO. Uh, now you've got the United States calling for joint ammo purchases between all of them and then also transferring ammo and weapons seized from Iran uh, to Ukraine. So you've got that one side. But now, listen to this. You potentially have China going from a nuclear, or sort of from a, from a neutral posture, I should say, to potentially one that is provoked now by the Chinese weather balloon and potentially now wanting to back Russia with actual lethal weapons support for Russia. And I'm going to play a video here in a moment, but I want you to think about how this is setting up so far. Again, Russia, Belarus, Iran, China. On the other side, US, Germany, UK, France, Canada, Spain, Portugal. It's not looking good. Then, of course, you've got tensions in sort of the, the middle countries as well, like Turkey and Greece having their own sort of fighting going on. It's sort of like an offshoot, uh, offshoot of fighting over here. And then you've got Taiwan and Japan supporting the United States with South Korea. It's all a mess. But take a listen to this uh, two-minute report here, and uh, we'll listen to this together, and then I'll add some more commentary. Here we go. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> It'd be nice, Kevin, if you actually would play the audio. You have to turn the audio on for it to work for people. Goodness gracious, you gotta, you gotta unmute it. I still have it. Better, but it, it's not about. It, it might... Sorry. Okay. Apparently, I can't get this going. There the we go. pace was brisk as the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken headed off for private talks with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi. The meeting arranged on the sidelines of the Munich Security Conference. It was the first top-level meeting between the two superpowers since the US shot down what it says was a Chinese spy balloon. Keep in mind, there has now been talk uh, between the United States and China, which is good because initially China didn't answer a phone call after we shot down their spy balloon. Now there are a lot of murmuring saying, obviously China's like, dude, it was a weather balloon, it blew off course. Obviously, the United States is like, no, it's a spy balloon. Obviously, the mainstream media is supporting the narrative that it's a spy balloon. And I think we widely believe it's a spy balloon. Although, we were supposed to shoot it down and then look at the parts and then show the world, look at all this spy technology that Russia was flying above us. And so far, there's been quiet, which is raising the question of, okay, well, what if it really was just a weather balloon? It's insane because you just almost don't even really know what to believe anymore. But what we do know is things are getting more and more tense, not less tense. Let's keep listening in. <gasps> Whoa. The incident triggered a major rift with Mr. Blinken canceling a planned trip to Beijing. Mr. Secretary, how did the meeting go? The talks lasted just over an hour. China sent a surveillance balloon uh, over our territory, violating our sovereignty, violating uh, international law. And I told him quite simply that that was unacceptable and can never happen again. China maintains it was just a civilian balloon that blew off course. Regrettably. All right, we don't have to listen to all this part. Let's, let me just fast forward here to the, what Blinken says. That China is considering providing lethal support to Russia in its aggression against Ukraine. Uh, and I made clear that that would have uh, serious consequences. That's the most important part right there, is Blinken just yesterday in an interview with Meet the Press, said China is considering sending lethal weapons to Russia to support Russia. Now, China has been uh, sending uh, supplies and selling supplies to Russia, but they've so far been non-lethal. And that's because the Chinese government has been trying to, you know, minimize tensions between the United States to minimize additional sanctions. Of course, this whole weather balloon debacle kind of made those things worse. And now it's leading to China, all right, maybe we do want to end up selling lethal weapons to Russia. So what you have is basically a giant SH-9T show going on. Because again, you have the United States thinking about somehow convincing the United Nations, which is supposed to be pretty much everyone in the world, 
with the exception of, of, of uh, very few. But you're supposed to have the United Nations providing sort of neutrality between everyone. But now the United States is potentially pressuring the United Nations to remove their weapons and arms embargoes, allowing them to take weapons that were basically seized, which is just a nice way of saying stolen from Iran, and giving them to Ukraine. At the same time as you've got what really is setting up to start looking like two major axes, Russia, Belarus, Iran, China, U.S., Japan, South Korea, the United Kingdom, France, Spain, Portugal, Canada, so on and so forth. Yikes. It's just not good. And I don't think it's a very good idea that people like Rishi Sunak are saying, we need to double down on Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. Even though we know that's what Ukraine wants, that's kind of the whole reason a lot of this started. It's obviously a lot more involved, but we already have the idea uh, that, that you could see Finland, for example, separately get voted into NATO, which is also stone's throw from Russia. Remember when, uh, uh, when, when you had the first uh, incursions into Ukraine, you actually had a lot of Russians flee Russia itself uh, through, uh, uh, through the trains to Finland. They're that directly connected. Uh, anyway, this is wild. I think it's, uh, it's uh, you know, should, should, you should be paying a lot of attention to what's going on here and how things are developing because the posturing is getting worse and not better. And I don't just mean verbal posturing either. It was just last week that the Financial Times was reporting that Russia is setting up uh, a, a, essentially rows of their air force on the border of Ukraine preparing for a larger incursion. That would include helicopters and jets, fighter jets, and the Financial Times arguing that Russia's uh, Air Force is actually pretty unscathed from this war so far. It's just not good. It's just not good. Now, A. Salam over here says, FUD, FUD, nothing's going to happen. You know, what's interesting is when people say FUD, I actually think it's a very uneducated phrase to use FUD uh, because it implies that what someone is saying is fake news, right? FUD carries the connotation of fake news because people use it in the same way. Oh, that's just FUD. But fear, uncertainty, and doubt is often based on fact, not fake news. And so when people use the phrase FUD, I actually think, and this isn't to be offensive to this person, but I think it's, um, I think it's uneducated to use the word FUD. So I would stop using the word FUD. Uh, I, I would say, I don't, you, you're welcome to say, I don't think it's going to happen. Just like what Ukrainians said the night before the incursion. You know, I, I had a connection with someone in Ukraine the night before on February 23rd, 2020. The night before. And they said, this is just Western hysteria. Nothing's going to happen. Russia's not going to invade. The very next day the invasion happens, I send off another email. I'm like, dude, are you okay? And they're like, yeah, we had to flee to Sicily. And I love this person to death. Like, I'm super worried. And I obviously I care about everyone's lives. But like, this was a, a, a near and dear connection to me. So I think it's important to remember that uh, using the phrase FUD is not a way to discount reality. And the reality is we have problems that are escalating not de-escalating.